I would just like to introduce the main event here tonight. He uh, is a former journalist. Uh, he worked in the newspaper called Independent. Uh, and uh, he's written two books. The first one was called Gold Save the Queen. And the second one is the reason he's here tonight. He's written the book called Chasing the Scream. And his name is Johan Hari. We're very happy to have you here. Let's give him a big applause. Thank you. Cheers. Hello. Hi. Um, I always feel a bit... <laughs> It's a little bit weird when, you know these, these microphones they put on your head? Um, whenever they put one on me, I always think of the, when I first had to wear one about a year ago, I said to the, it was in the States, and I said to the guy who was putting it on my head, oh, if you put one of these on my head, I'll feel like Madonna. And he said, you should always feel like Madonna. <laughs> and, I, and I thought it was the most American thing I'd ever heard anyone say. Um, also, I should say, I'm, I'm really uh, glad to be in a place where people understand English so well because I spend a lot of time in the United States and I had this slightly weird experience when I was um, researching my book where loads of people literally just cannot understand what British people are saying at all. And I went into this diner in, in Tyler County in Texas uh, just before I went to interview a Mexican hitman who's in prison there. And uh, I went in and I tried to order like, I can't remember, like some grotesque fattening food which is all they had. And the woman in the, the diner, she said to me, what? When I spoke, what do you say? And I said, oh, like, can I have like, some pancakes? And she said to me, do you speak English? <laughs> and I said, my people invented it. And she said, what? <laughs> so it was very unfortunate. Uh, I should also just say one other thing to uh, apologize, which is I'm slightly disorientated and jet lagged, and I made a horrific mistake about three weeks ago. I'm slightly worried I might make some similar mistakes. I want to forewarn you. I was doing loads of back to back interviews on the phone, and I did one with a South African radio station, and I was super tired. And then after that, I did one with a New Zealand radio station. And somehow I forgot that I'd stopped speaking to the South Africans and started speaking to the New Zealanders. And so I was talking about racism in drug policy in America. And the interviewer said, well, we don't have many problems with racism in our country, but we can, you know, it doesn't, it's not really a factor. And I said, I find that an extraordinary thing for you to say with your, <laughs> with your country's history. And he said, well, you know, I'm surprised to hear you say that. I said, you should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> And it was just, anyway, then it all became clear. Anyway, um, I want to start um, by talking about something that might seem really far away from Norway, and I actually don't think is as far away as we would like to believe. Um, early in researching my book, um, I decided to go to Arizona, uh, because I knew that Arizona has a horrific prison system, and particularly stigmatizes and punishes addicts. And I'd heard that there was a prison there in the desert that makes women go out on chain gangs wearing T-shirts saying, I was a drug addict, and forces them to dig graves while members of the public jeer at them. And I decided to go to this, this prison. But before I went, I interviewed a woman called Donna Leone Ham, a really amazing woman who works on prison reform in, like prison, she's the, one of the only two people who works on prisoners' rights in Arizona. And I was talking to her, and I said something. I asked her a question, which is basically what I ask everyone. I said, like, tell me about something that surprised you in the time you've been working on this. And when she went through a big, long list of bad things, and then she said, there was the time they put that woman in a cage and cooked her. That was quite bad. And then she carried on, talking about something else. And I said, sorry, Donna, can we go, can we go back a second? Can you tell me what, what you mean? And it turns out, there was a woman called Marsha Powell who kept being arrested either for having meth or crack or for prostituting herself to get crack or meth. And one morning she woke up in Perryville Prison in 2009 and she was suicidal. She was screaming and she was suicidal. And to shut her up, they took her and they put her in an outdoor cage. It's what uh, we would call in Britain like a holding cage. It's where they put you when they're checking you into the prison. But it's, this is Arizona, it's the desert, and it's an uncovered cage. And by law, you're only allowed to put people there for 45 minutes because it's an uncovered cage in the desert. And there's two stories about what happened next. 
The prison guards say they forgot her. The other prisoners say that they mocked her, they jeered at her. Um, what we do know is that she screamed for help, she shat herself, she begged for water. In the end, they did call an ambulance for her, and by the time the ambulance had arrived, she had been cooked. No one was ever punished for what happened to Marsha Powell, right? No one was ever criminally punished for what happened to her. I then went and tracked down uh, the father of her children and got the story of her life. She was um, thrown out of home when she was 13 years old by her adopted parents who apparently never liked her. She ended up living on the beach. From about 13 or 14, she started prostituting herself to survive. She fell in with a, a gang that sort of looked after her and sort of pimped her out and exploited her. Um, she, very early on, she started using drugs, I presume, to deal with the pain and grief of what she was, she was going through. I looked up the police transcripts when they arrested her, and she was incoherent when they arrested her, very often, not always. And the police repeatedly laugh at her, they mock her, they mock the incoherent things she said. Um, she had moments when she got her life together, when she met this guy, Rich, where her life went a lot better. She had several years when she didn't use any drugs, when she got clean. She had kids. She loved her kids. She lost her kids. She had loads of things. She loved, she loved swimming. She loved swimming in, in, in rivers. Um, and the thing I thought when I was thinking about the fact that no one was punished for what was done to this woman is I kept thinking over the last year, I'm sure you all know about the Black Lives Matter campaign in the United States where you know, there's been this big movement against the, the killing of uh, African Americans by police and prison guards and things like that. And I kept thinking we need an Addicts Lives Matter campaign. There's very few minorities where you can just kill them and get away with it. It's very unusual. You have to have really dehumanized and stigmatized a group to cause their death. When Amy Winehouse died, I heard loads of otherwise nice people say, well, she kind of deserved it. She brought it on herself. She was an addict. And I can't think of any other minority. I know some racist people. I don't know anyone so racist that if a prominent black person died, they'd go, well, who cares? I know some homophobic people. I don't know anyone so homophobic that if Elton John died, they'd just go, ah. Who cares? He brought it on himself. He was gay. You'd have to be really far out. It's a sign of how extreme the stigma is. And when I was growing up as a kid in Britain under Margaret Thatcher, um, I thought of Scandinavia as like paradise across the water, right? Like I was watching the British state being dismantled and it was becoming a really extreme and unequal society. And to know that there were places like Norway and Sweden where you believe really strongly that you don't leave people behind, that you have a strong and cohesive and equal society, and that it works so well was really inspiring to me and a lot of people who were developing their consciousness around the time of Thatcherism. So it was really weird to me when I went to this thing called the World Federation Against Drugs Conference. It was, um, it's a kind of anti-drugs jamboree that happens every year somewhere in the world where all the kind of drug war people get together. And at this conference, there was a guy called Viktor Ivanov. He's the Russian drug czar. And he's responsible for some of the worst policies in the world when it comes to drugs. What they do is they deliberately harass, harass and arrest people who they catch carrying needles. So if you wanted to spread HIV, that's what you would do. Because it means it guarantees that addicts won't carry clean needles, so they share needles. It's why Russia has one of the fastest rising HIV crises in the entire world. And the vast majority of drug addicts in Russia are... <clears throat> are HIV positive, and bear in mind they have very poor treatment there, so that's almost a death sentence. Compare that to, say, 2% in Britain, where we have pretty good harm reduction now. Um, and the attitude is basically, we want them to die, right? When you confront Russian officials about this and you say, but they basically say, well, if they die, so what? Uh, a bit like the attitude people had about Amy Winehouse, a lot of people. Anyway, the Russian drug czar was there. The American drug czar responsible for a system that could cook someone in a cage and you know, not, not care. Um, and it was really weird when they came to make their kind of joint statement to see the Swedish minister and the Norwegian government and the Scandinavian representatives line up with Viktor Ivanov and the American drug czar, uh, Gil Kerlikowski, to, as the only countries to demand a tougher international drug war. And I thought, what? this isn't the Scandinavia that I know about what's, what's going on here. And obviously I started doing some more research. I'm afraid that your governments have some of the worst drug laws in, in Europe, um, and this is killing some of your fellow citizens. So in the European Union, the average deaths of overdose are 17 people per million citizens. Here in Norway, 
it is 69 people per million citizens. A Norwegian drug addict is 30 times more likely to die of an overdose than a Portuguese drug addict, where they've decriminalized all drugs. That's, more, that's nearly 250 people a year. To give a sense of perspective, that's the equivalent to three Anders Breivik massacres every year in this country of drug addicts, year after year after year. And the same attitude, now clearly you're not cooking people in cages, but dying of an overdose is, is not so much better than being cooked in a cage. And the, um, there are policies that we know could end these deaths, so I want to talk about that. And the fact that we are not currently demanding those policies is because we have dehumanized and stigmatized addicts. And I think you can really see the tension within Norwegian society. This is a very compassionate society. In most ways, if my country, Britain, became more like Norway, it would become an awful lot better. But you can really see that tension when it comes to drug users by the fact that you have a few safe injecting drug sites, and sometimes the police wait outside, and they arrest people on their way in or their way out which, by the way, defeats the point of a safe injecting site, obviously. But I think it shows the schizophrenia, the tensions within, within Norwegian society and the dividedness. Um, th this was a very personal issue for me. Um, one of my earliest memories is of trying to wake up one of my relatives and not being able to, and I didn't understand why at first, but as I got older, I realized we had addiction in my family. And one of the reasons I wanted to, to, to write my book is because I wanted... I wanted to be able to think about that. I, I kind of, when I sat down to write, I realized we were coming up to the 100th anniversary of when drugs were first banned. It's now exactly 100 years since drugs were first banned in the US and they then imposed it on the rest of the world. And as I was thinking about it, I, I thought, oh, at first I was really cocky. I thought, oh, I know loads about this subject. You know, I've lived through it. I, I've written about it a lot as a journalist. And then I suddenly realized, as I sat down to write, that there were loads of incredibly basic questions I didn't know the answer to. You know, why did we go to war against drug users and drug addicts 100 years ago? Why do we carry on when it seems to be failing so badly? What are the actual alternatives like in practice and what really causes drug use and drug addiction? And I couldn't find the answers in what I was reading. I kind of found hints, but not really the answers. So I decided to go on a kind of journey. I didn't realize at the start how long it would be. It ended up being like 30,000 miles and uh, 12 different countries. But what I wanted to do was sit with people whose lives had been changed one way or another by this approach and by the alternative. So I got to know lots of people from a, you know, a transgender crack dealer in Brooklyn to um, a hitman for the deadliest Mexican drug cartel to uh, a scientist who spends lots of time feeding hallucinogens to mongooses um, to uh, the only country that's decriminalized all drugs. And I think the main things I realized are that almost everything we think we know about this subject is wrong. And it's interesting, in Norway, I've been hearing some of the really deep myths that actually, um, it's like going back in time a bit in the United States. So I want to just go through some of them and then talk about some different ways of thinking about this. It is very widely believed here that cannabis causes psychosis. Uh, it's very widely believed in Scandinavia. There was a really interesting moment when Colorado legalized marijuana, The Onion, you guys all know The Onion, don't you? The um, satirical American newspaper that does fake joke stories. They ran a news headline that was... Uh, on first day of marijuana legalization, 37 people die of marijuana overdoses. And it described a scene from like an emergency room in Colorado where people were like dropping dead everywhere and the doctor sinks to his knees and says, why did we legalize marijuana, why? The Swedish drugs minister, Beatrice Ask, tweeted that article and basically said, I told you so. <laughs> the fact that that can happen, she could read that story and think that was a description of reality is a sign of how unbelievably far from reality the debate in Scandinavia is at the moment about cannabis. Um, it's important to understand where these ideas come from. So, at the end, of, as alcohol prohibition was ending, a man called Harry Anslinger was appointed as the head of the Department of Prohibition in the United States. So he takes over this really big government department that's just lost the war on alcohol and it's been discredited and he wants to keep his, apart his department going. And he had said very clearly publicly that cannabis is not harmful, he's not bothered about it, and then he suddenly realizes that his department you know, is gonna shut down, right? That you can't keep a department going on nothing. He suddenly announces that cannabis is an evil drug that causes psychosis. He latched onto a particular case, it was kind of made famous at the time by the, the Fox News of its day, something called Hearst Newspapers. And they latched onto a case of a boy in Florida who, 21-year-old boy called Victor Lacata, who hacked his family to death with an axe. 
and they announced that he had smoked marijuana. This is what will happen if you smoke marijuana. This is why we need to ban marijuana. And in the wake of that hysteria, marijuana is banned. Years later, someone goes back and looks at the psychiatric files for Victor Lacanza. He didn't even smoke marijuana. His family had he'd had insanity in his family. He's actually been, they'd actually been told to institutionalize him a year before, but they wanted to keep him at home. It was a completely false scare story. It's really interesting how you see those false scare stories echoing across the world. One of the ways we know it's false is and this, uh, Professor David Nutt, who was the former chief scientific advisor on drugs in Britain, is very good explaining this. If cannabis caused psychosis, there's one thing that would happen. When cannabis use goes up, psychosis would go up, right? That's pretty straightforward. We have an enormous amount of data from across the world, loads of different countries, where cannabis use has risen. Psychosis rates remain the same. In Britain, there has been a 40-fold increase in cannabis use since 1960, and there has been no increase in psychosis. That tells you, you know, how close to reality this debate is. Um, but there's another, there's a kind of deeper idea about drugs, and it's something that really surprised me, actually, because my family's experience was of using drugs and being terribly harmed by them. So I went into this with the prejudice that drug use is just inherently harmful. And there were these facts that I kept stumbling across that were kind of puzzling. The UN Office of Drug Control are the main drug war body in the world, right? Their slogan is, a drug-free world, we can do it, which tells you that they're, they're not my side of the debate, right? Uh, it's also a slogan, to find a slogan as surreal as that, you'd have to think of like Stalinist Russia and the pledges that you'll get rid of greed. Or I mean, it's so weird. Anyway, um, even the UN Office of Drug Control admitted in a recent study that 90% of currently banned drug use is what they call non-problematic. That means it doesn't cause addiction and doesn't harm the use itself. 90%, 9-0, overwhelming majority. I was really surprised, and I frankly didn't believe this until I looked at the research for a long time and looked at the criticism of it. 90, according to Professor Carl Hart's work at Columbia University and all the work since, you know, you think about crack and meth. I would have believed that almost everyone who uses crack and meth becomes addicted. 90% of people who use crack and meth do not become addicted to crack and meth. Right? It seems to be, now, we know this about alcohol, right? If we go out of here into, I think there's a bar downstairs, isn't there? If we go down to that bar, right, we'll know 90% of the people there will be using alcohol just because it makes their life better, right? And there might be some who are alcoholics who need our love and support, but we know that they're a small minority. That's actually true of all drug use. A small minority of the people who become addicted. And that leads to the question, well, why does that small minority become addicted? What's going on with them that's not going on with everyone else? And this was one of the findings that most threw me when I, when I found it out, and it took me a long time to really absorb it. If you had said to me, when I started the work on the book, what causes, I don't know, heroin addiction, I would have looked at you like you were really stupid. <laughs> I would have said, well, the clue is in the name, right? It's called heroin addiction. It's obviously caused by heroin. Um, as I've said before, you know, we think that if the first 20 people here, if you guys all used heroin, I like the idea of having a death metal uh, backing soundtrack to this, by the way, this is, it fits my mood. Um, the, um, if, you know, we think if you guys all used heroin together for 20 days, by day 21, you would all be heroin addicts because there, for a simple reason, there are chemical hooks in heroin that your bodies would start to physically need. And if once you stopped, your body would have this desperate craving. That's what I thought. In fact, I literally thought I had seen that with people that I love. The first thing that alerted me to the fact that there's something not right about that story is when it was explained to me. Um, in Britain, and I actually didn't look up, I don't think in Norway, but in Britain and Canada and a lot of Western Europe, if you have a hip replacement operation when you turn 70, or if you step out into the street and you get hit by a truck and you need, your hip gets broken, when you're taken to hospital, you're given loads of diamorphine for the pain, right? Diamorphine is heroin. It's just the medical name for heroin. It's much stronger heroin than you'd ever score on the streets because it's medically pure, whereas the stuff you get from dealers is obviously contaminated. Very little of it is actually heroin. So if what we think about addiction is right, what should happen to all those people? Some of them, a lot of them, should become addicts, right? They're exposed to all the same chemical hooks as the addicts that I met today here in Oslo, right? This has been studied very carefully. It virtually never happens. And when I learned that, you will have noticed your grandmother was not turned into a junkie by her hip replacement operation, right? Um, and when I learned that, it was so weird, I didn't really understand it, um, until I went and met a guy called Bruce Alexander, who's a professor in Vancouver, who 
Explain to me, the, this idea of addiction that we've all got in our heads comes partly from a series of experiments that were done earlier in the 20th century. They're really simple experiments. You can do them at home if you feel a bit cruel later on. You get a rat and you put it in a cage and you give it two water bottles. One is just water and the other is water laced with either heroin or cocaine. If you do that, the rat will almost always prefer the drugged water and almost always kill itself. So there you go, right? That's our story about addiction. But in the 70s, Professor Alexander looked at this experiment and said, hang on a minute, we're putting this rat in an empty cage. It's got nothing to do except use these drugs. What would happen if we did this differently? So he built a cage that he called Rat Park, which is basically paradise for rats, right? It's what rats dream of. Uh, um, so they have loads of cheese, they've got loads of colored balls, they've got loads of tunnels, apparently rats love that stuff. Um, they've got loads of friends, they can have loads of sex. And they've got both the water bottles, the normal water and the drugged water. And of course, they try both the bottles because they don't know what's in them. But this is the fascinating thing. In Rat Park, they don't like the drugged water. They almost never use it. None of them ever use it compulsively. None of them ever overdose. So when they're isolated, you have almost 100% um, compulsive use and death. And when they have good lives, none. Very striking, right? This a human example that I can talk about. I don't want to talk too much about this because it covers some of the territory from my TED talk that you may have seen. But the, the um, give the human example. At the same time as Rat Park, um, there was a human experiment going on called the Vietnam War. In Vietnam, 20% of American troops were using loads of heroin. And if you look at the news reports from the time, the American government and the American media were really worried because they thought, my God, we're going to have loads of junkies on the streets of the United States when the war ends. What are we going to do? And the soldiers came home, and they were followed and studied, and the vast majority of them, 95% of them, just stopped. Now, that makes absolutely no sense if you believe the old theory of addiction about chemical hooks. But if you understand this different way of thinking about addiction, it makes perfect sense. If I took any of you to a hellish, pestilential jungle where you don't want to be, and you're forced to kill a load of innocent people and maybe die, you'd be a lot more likely to want to take heroin than you are now, unless something's going very wrong in your life today. Um, you know, the core of addiction is about not wanting to be present in your life because your life is unbearable. Now, there's loads of different reasons why your life can be unbearable. Um, there's, there's as many different reasons as there are reasons why humans feel pain. But that's at the core of what, of what we're talking about. Once you know that, you understand why a big part of Norwegian drug policy fails. Because a lot of it, we, uh, we met just, just before we came here with a guy who had, uh, has a serious addiction problem, who's about 25. You know, he was first identified when he was a teenager. The first thing they did is take him to some kind of boot camp, as far as I could tell, where they march him out into the forest. They shame him, they stigmatized him, they kept telling him to shut up, they had to learn. Then they took him to a place to work with dogs. He doesn't like dogs. Um, uh, then he got out, he of course carries on using, and he keeps being put into these shame-based rehabs where they keep telling him their solution. I asked him, did anyone ever ask you like, what's gone wrong in your life and how, what you might want to make your life better? And he kind of looked a little bit puzzled and said, not really, no. Uh, that's happening here in Norway. Now, it's, it's not as bad as in a lot of countries, that's important to say. But that's still bad. This guy's in a terrible state. He overdosed several times this summer. He nearly died. I think there's a quite high chance in this country he'd, he'll die. I've been to places where there would be no chance he would die of an overdose, and I want to talk about them. Um, if you look at why the overdose rate is so scandalously high here in Norway, one of the highest in, in Europe, <clears throat> there's a few reasons. The first is because you have a punishment-based model, towards drug use. This is one of the very few countries in the world where drug use is a crime. It's very unusual. Um, when people are, when, if you're with a person who's overdosing, often Norwegian people are afraid to call for an ambulance because they're worried that they'll be arrested and punished for using drugs with this person. Now, there's an absolute way you can, you can just end that. New Jersey introduced something called the Good Samaritan Law. Really simple law. Um, it just, legal guarantee, if you are with an overdosing person, you will never be prosecuted, right? All it is, Good Samaritan law, massively reduced the death toll in New Jersey. I would really implore you, you can save the lives of your fellow citizens if you guys form a campaign and fight for Good Samaritan law here in Norway. You will save huge numbers of people's lives. I cannot conceive how anyone could argue against that unless they're really wicked and shame-based. Um, <laughs> Um, 
one, and if any of you want to set up that campaign, email me and I'll introduce you to the people who did it in New Jersey and they can explain how they did it. Um, another big reason why you have very high levels of overdose is actually a commonality across everywhere that has prohibition. Imagine if every time you drank alcohol, you didn't know if it was, I'm sorry, indicating as if this was alcohol, I promise you it's coffee. Um, every time you drank alcohol, you didn't know if it was 1% proof or 70% proof, right? You just didn't know what kind of alcohol or what was in it. You would be a lot more likely to get sick, to get alcohol poisoning, right? Um, that's what happens in prohibition when you use drugs. You don't know what's in it. We can send health and safety inspectors to Budweiser's brewery and Smirnoff's brewery and check what they're doing. We can't send health and safety inspectors to inspect the bowels of whatever poor Eastern European woman swallowed some drugs to get them here into Norway, right? We can't do that. You can't regulate a prohibited product. A prohibited product will become inherently more dangerous. And the other is, of course, that you punish and stigmatize people who need help. What they learn, the other reason why you have such a high overdose rate, right, they learn to not come forward for help. Well, that guy we met today, what's he learned? Those people are never going to help you. They're going to shame you. They're going to stigmatize you. They're going to tell you that you've failed every time you turn up. Who would turn up for that? If you had a problem in your life, would you go to people who were going to tell you that you'd fucked up again? Of course not, right? Um, and it's important to understand when we talk about the alternatives to this disastrous way of doing things, that there's nothing abstract about this debate. Very often when you're talking about how bad the current situation is, people will go, yes, but how would you, how would you do another way? What would it be like? And they ask these very abstract questions. It's really important to understand the alternatives have been tried. Every possible model has been tried. I've been to the countries that exemplify those models, and we can look at the results. So the shame-based model, which has a big component in Norway, it's not the only component, but it's a big component. Look at that, right? Um, Vietnam and Arizona have the pure shame-based model. I went to Vietnam. They make drug users go to uh, work camps, gulags, basically, where they make them do forced labor and they shame them and tell them how disgusting they are, right? How well does that work? The Open Society Foundation's report found that 99% of them relapse. So it's a complete failure. Arizona is similar. Those women I met on that chain gang when I went out with them, the vast majority of them, it's not... It actually deepens their addiction. It traumatizes them more. It's not just that it doesn't work. Some people say those approaches don't work. It's worse than that. The approach is counterproductive. Um, we can also look at the absolute opposite ends of the spectrum. I've been to the places that have done the absolute opposite end of the spectrum. I want to talk to you about, about two of them. Um, so Portugal, in the year 2000, had one of the worst drug problems in Europe. 1% of the population was addicted to heroin. And every year they tried the shame-based, stigma-based, punishment-based model more, and every year the problem got worse. And one day the prime minister and the leader of the opposition did something really radical, something no one had done in the war on drugs since Harry Anslinger, the guy who starts this hysteria. They said, shall we ask some scientists to figure out what would actually help? So they... They set up a panel of scientists and doctors, right? So drug policy up to now has basically been based on hysterias, madnesses, onion articles, that kind of thing, right? Uh, what they said was, let's set up a panel of scientists and doctors and just ask them to figure out what would genuinely solve this problem. And we'll agree in advance that we'll do whatever they recommend. So it just took it out of politics. So the panel went away, led by this guy who became friends with me. I became friends with an amazing man called Hua Gulao, who's a doctor. And they came back and they said, decriminalize all drugs, from cannabis to crack. But, and this is the crucial next step, take all the money we currently spend on making addicts' lives worse and spend it instead on turning their lives around. And it's interesting, it's not really what we think of as drug treatment in most of the world. It's not really rehab-based. So they... <clears throat> They do some residential rehab, a little. They do some psychological support. But the biggest thing they did is the opposite of what we do. We give addicts criminal records, we shame them, we stigmatize them, we tell them they failed. What they did in Portugal was set up a huge program of opportunity creation for addicts. Say you used to be a mechanic. They'll go to a garage and they'll say, if you employ this guy for a year, we'll pay half his wages. They set up a huge program of microloans so addicts could set up small businesses doing the things that they thought they were good at. Think about that guy I met today, right? No one has ever said to him, what are you good at? In Portugal, they said, what are you good at? Do you want to set up a business doing that? And the results are now very clear. It's been nearly 15 years since this experiment began. So 
50%, 50% has been the fall in injecting drug use in Portugal. There has been nothing like that in Spain next door where they haven't changed their policy. So half of all injecting drug use has gone. Uh, HIV transmission is massively down. Overdose deaths are massively down. Street crime is massively down. Prostitution is massively down. One of the ways you know it's worked so well is that Portugal has a pretty competitive political system. They've got five main political parties. None of them want to go back to the old system. I went and interviewed a guy called Juan Figuera, who was the top drug cop in Portugal, who led the opposition to the decriminalization when it happened. And he said a lot of the things that I'm sure loads of people here in Norway and in Britain would say, which is surely if you decriminalize all drugs, you'll have loads of people using drugs, it'll be a disaster. And he said to me, everything I said would happen didn't happen. And everything the other side said would happen did. And he talked about how he felt really ashamed that he'd spent so many years arresting and imprisoning drug users when he could have been helping them instead. Um, I want to talk about one other place. So it's important to understand the difference between decriminalization and legalization. Decriminalization is when you stop punishing users, but they still have to go to criminal gangs to get their drugs. And legalization is where you open up some legal route for them to get it. To put it crudely, decriminalization shuts down orange as the new black, and legalization shuts down Breaking Bad. Right? Now, I'm in favor of both. Um, but what they did in Switzerland was slightly different. They had a big heroin problem as well. You might remember there's famous images of Switzerland and the Swiss heroin crisis. Um, and what they did was legalize heroin. Now, it's important that doesn't mean... Uh, legalization means different things for different drugs, right? In the same way that in Britain, you can own a dog, a monkey, and a lion. But the rules are different, right? I can't just go into a shop and buy a lion. <laughs> you know? um, and in the same way, if you're a heroin addict in Switzerland, what they do is assign you to a clinic. Uh, you go to that clinic every morning. You use your heroin there. They give it to you. You're monitored by doctors. And then you leave, and you go to your job. And one of the striking things is almost everyone gets a job. When you do this, the, um, uh, the chaos of being a street user ends, right? Women stop prostituting themselves. Street prostitution ended. It turns out, this is an interesting lesson, Women don't want to have sex with disgusting random strangers for money. Um, who knew? Uh, the, um, the men's property crime massively fell. Um, but the interesting thing is, so when you go on that program, you can stay on it as long as you want, and you can set your own dose, which kind of surprised me. But one of the psychiatrists explained to me, when you start the program, they give you help to like, turn your life around. They help you to get a job and housing and build relationships. And the, everyone chooses to reduce their dose over time, even though there's no pressure. There was no one who was still on the program when I went who'd been on the program at the start 10 years before, which tells you something about addiction. As your life gets better, you want to be present in your life more, and you don't want to be so drugged, right? The, the, it's kind of obvious when you know that. Um, do you know how many deaths they've had from overdoses on legal heroin in Switzerland? None. Zero. I don't mean 0%, rounding down to zero. I mean nobody has died of an overdose. So it's, compare that to here. Remember, three Anders Breivik massacres every year. You can end them. Um, and it's also important that it's, the way Ruth Dreyfus, the Swiss president, amazing visionary Swiss president, who's my candidate for president of the world, uh, when she campaigned for this, she's such an amazing person, um, when she campaigned for this, I love her, uh, when she campaigned for this, <laughs> sorry, I love her so much, uh, when she campaigned for this, one of the things she explained to, and government, bear in mind, Switzerland is not, this didn't happen in San Francisco, right? I'm a Swiss citizen because my dad's from there. Switzerland, you know, my grandmother did not get the vote until 1976. Switzerland is not a cuddly left-wing country. Um, and yet, 70% of Swiss people voted to keep heroin legal for addicts. And it's interesting, when Ruth Dreyfus um, sold this to the, the Swiss public, what she said is, you think legalization means chaos and anarchy. Prohibition means chaos and anarchy. It means unknown criminals selling unknown chemicals to unknown drug users, all in the dark, filled with violence and chaos. Legalization is a way of restoring order to the violence and chaos that you have under prohibition. That was the argument that clinched it with the people in Switzerland. I just want to very quickly talk about one other thing, which I think is actually the biggest issue when it comes to the war on drugs. I actually think it's bigger than anything we've talked about. Um, 
And Norway is a country that rightly has a really amazing reputation for being a positive player in the world, for aid. I can't tell you how many poor countries I've been to where they have amazing stuff built by the Norwegian government. It's kind of amazing. Um, and this is an area where Norwegian policy has, and British policy and so many other countries' policies, really produces a catastrophe, which is the, pro the violence caused by drug prohibition. And just the best way to explain it is, if any of you guys went down to the bar now and decided to steal a bottle of vodka, Right? Maybe I've depressed you so much you want to do that. Um, if you do that and they catch you, they'll ring the police and the police will come and take you away. So that guy on the bar, he doesn't need to be violent. He doesn't need to be intimidating. He has the power of the law to uphold his property rights. If you decided you wanted to steal some cannabis or some cocaine or some heroin and the guy in this neighborhood, and I'm fairly sure there is one, catches you, he can't call the police, can he? Right? They would take him away. He's got to fight you. Now, you don't want to be having a fight every day. So you've got to establish a reputation for being such a badass that people won't be so stupid as to fight you. The war on drugs creates a war for drugs. The Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Friedman calculated that this causes 10,000 additional murders every year in the United States. Think about how much we talk about Syria, right? Totally rightly, it's correct that we talk about Syria. Almost as many people have died in northern Mexico in the violence there. I went there. This is violence entirely caused by this dynamic. These are rival drug gangs murdering each other to control the supply route. And sometimes you'll get people saying, oh, this is violence caused by drug users in the West. It's complete nonsense. It's caused by drug prohibition imposed by the West. And if you want to understand the difference, ask yourself, where are the violent alcohol dealers in Chicago, right? When alcohol was banned, there was an enormous amount of fighting between violent alcohol dealers. That's what Al Capone was. We've all heard of the St. Valentine's Day massacre, right? They killed each other. Today, the head of Heineken does not send kids to go and kill the head of Smirnoff, right? That doesn't happen. Nothing's changed about the drug. The drug is the same drug it always was. What's changed is the system of regulation. Regulated In a regulated legal market, people compete on the quality of their product and on price. In an unregulated, prohibited market, they compete on who's, like, who's more willing to commit violence. And that is absolutely horrific in northern Mexico. You know, I met people, you know, I could tell a lot of stories. If you want to ask me about that, I'm happy to. It's the, I've reported from some terrible places, the war in the Congo, the Gaza Strip. This is the worst I've ever seen by far. Um, so just to say the last thing, you know, <clears throat> uh, someone said to me in Sweden that, you know, in some ways they think of drugs as the perfect enemy for Swedish society. And I said, you know, from what I admire about Scandinavian society, and I hugely admire this society, I think the perfect enemy is the idea of leaving people behind, the idea of leaving your fellow citizens to die when it's completely preventable, or the idea of condemning some of the most wretched people in the world to the most violent possible deaths. I think that's the enemy of the vision that you guys stand for and that you inspire the world with through your social democratic vision. And to me, this is the missing plank of your welfare state. This is the missing plank of such an important uh, vision that you represent to the world. And it's something that you can correct, right? Everywhere I went where they moved beyond the war on drugs, as I said, it's super controversial until they do it. And then everyone says, oh, why didn't we do this all along? Um, for, you know, for a century now, we've had this experiment in drug prohibition. We can see the results. I would just say, you know, for 100 years, we have been singing war songs about addicts. We should have been singing love songs to them all along. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johan. Um, I forgot to say earlier that uh, we have a hashtag for the evening. It's Hari Norway. So you can write whatever you want, and um, we'll keep track and maybe ask some of the questions, if there are any relevant questions. So um, before I ask Hari some questions, I would like for the panel to be introduced. Um, we have, uh, we have uh, three people coming up here. They are Nils August Andresen. Uh, he's uh, an editor of the Norwegian conservative 
a journal called Minerva. And uh, he's also doing a PhD in the economic department at the University of Oslo. Yay. Also, we have uh, Fanny de Kort. Uh, she is a professor of psychology at the University of Oslo as well. Um, and we finally have Helene Jansvold, who's fled in from Portugal for the evening, wow. uh, for the occasion. And uh, she's working for the Centre of the European Monitoring Centre for Drugs and Drug Addiction. Um, which is called, uh, short for uh, EMCDDA, uh, in Lisbon, Portugal. And she's also part of an uh, EU research project studying, uh, amongst other things, uh, the Portuguese decriminalization model. So you can take place, Helena. <laughs> So, um, Johan, would you like to join me here, maybe oh, sure. for some, just a few questions before we sure. start the debate? Excellent. Um, so, uh, when when people hear uh, Johan Hari, your name, they say Rat Park. <laughs> That's kind of, in my opinion, what people like associate with you. Great. So, There's uh, worse things than rats, <laughs> I suppose. Worse things. Happy rats, at least. <laughs> yeah, but speaking of which. Um, uh, your book and your kind of theory of addiction is, is based partly on research on rats from the 1970s, the Bruce Alexander Rat Park. And so I'm wondering, uh, rats, 1970, addiction, 2015, how much can you say about human drug addiction from rats experiments? I mean, if you, if, if you, if you made like a cancer medicine, you, you, you tested it on rats, and you realized, oh, it works. You wouldn't just take it to human beings. You would be like really a lot more skeptical, wouldn't you? Oh, sure. That, that's why there's, you've got to look at the enormous range of human examples. Why, I'll give you one example. I mean, there's so many, and the book is full of them. Um, I'll give you one example. In Britain in the 18th century, huge numbers of people were driven out of the countryside into these disgusting urban slums, right? So they completely lost their identity, their livelihood, their sense of self, and they're in an awful situation. And there's a massive outbreak of gin. Uh, huge numbers of people start. You might have seen some of the famous paintings by Hogarth of like babies falling out windows while their mothers neck vodka. And gin, sorry, gin. And, um, th and it's true, there was a huge outbreak of alcoholism. And if you look at what was said at the time, there was a very widespread belief that gin was an evil drug. And gin had hijacked these people and taken them over. Now, when we look back on it, we can see, well, I, I'm sure that bar serves gin, and no one here has been hijacked by it, right? What we would see is that it was an increase in human suffering. So what you can look at is where there are outbreaks of social pain, you can see a significant increase in addiction. Now, this is not the only factor in addiction, and it's important to say that. And obviously, there's more in the book than you can distill into a 10-minute talk or whatever. So, for example, <clears throat> with chemical hooks, it's not the case that there are no chemical hooks. Some people misunderstand, and the book explains this, I hope. More, oh, <laughs> have you all vanished? The, a militant pro-chemical hooks person has uh, hi hijacked the evening. Um, the, um, it's not that there's no chemical hooks, and we can actually measure the role that chemical hooks play in addiction quite tightly. If you think about, so there's a consensus among scientists that uh, smoking cigarettes is the most chemically compelling addiction that we have. And... Um, we know wh what the chemical hook is. It's nicotine, right? It's been isolated. Again, this is totally... Everyone agrees. Uh, so when nicotine patches were invented, there's this huge wave of optimism because they think, my God, you know, uh, people will be able to get all of the drug, the chemical hook that they're addicted to without this filthy cancer-causing smoke. And what happened? 17% of people who use nicotine patches can stop, right? That's not nothing. That's a really large number of people. If you can expand that globally, you're talking about millions of people whose lives would be saved. But 17%, so the chemical hook is real, but 17% is not 83%, right? That's 83%. It's got to be explained in those other ways. And that's why, so there's lots of other factors, but this is a really, the reason I talk so much about this one 
is because A, it's the one that we have some control over. We can deal with social connection. There's not much we can do about genetics unless you're going to become a eugenicist, which I urge everyone not to do. You have quite a bad history of that here, by the way. Um, the, um, and, you know, uh, there's not, you know, the chemical hooks, there's a little we can do with, but connection and social change, we can do a lot with, as Portugal shows, mm. and lots of other examples show. Um, is the cause of addiction um, important when it comes to how we treat people who suffer from addiction? Sure. I mean, we wouldn't say that about anything. I mean, obviously. If you, if you think it's caused by the chemical... And, and a lot of rehab, particularly rehab in the United States, is based upon the idea that the problem is the, this chemical has hijacked your body and hijacked your brain, and you need to be separated from the chemical and taught to be averse to that ever seeing or interacting with that chemical ever again. Because you've got the wrong explanation, you get the wrong... It's why it has a disastrous success rate. Rehab centers in the United States have a catastrophic success rate. They almost always fail. Um, because it's based on the wrong theory. In Switzerland, when they, uh, sorry, in Switzerland and Portugal, when they moved to the right theory, they saw much bigger success rates. So, yeah, if you don't... It's like saying if you have an inaccurate map of a country, will it affect how you drive through it? Well, yeah, you're going to get lost. Mm. Um... You use um, Elton John and Russell Brand as, oh. <laughs> as, uh, as examples of people who uh, they got out of drug addiction by being given love and support and rehabilitation. Uh, but uh, you mentioned Amy Winehouse. And um, I've seen the film. I don't know how many of you have. Have you? No, I, I, for reasons that I'll tell you, I haven't watched All it. Right. Um, well, uh, the reason why I'm mentioning her is not because she's also a celebrity, or was, uh, but because the movie at least implicated that she was surrounded by lots of people who loved her, but also people who were really bad for her. And she was drawn between powers, people wanting different things for her. So my question is, um, is there a chance that this solution might be a bit uh, oversimplified? Um, considering that one person could always be surrounded by lots of different motives. I should say about Elton John, the thing I'm most pleased about with my book is it's the only book that will ever be praised by both Elton John and Noam Chomsky. And <laughs> I tried to persuade them to sing a duet about it, but Noam wasn't up for it. Um, the, um, yeah, the reason why I haven't seen the Amy Winehouse film is um, for a few reasons. So Amy Winehouse went to the same college as me, uh, sixth form college in Britain and I don't we were apparently there at the same time and I have a vague sense that I remember her but I think that might be my memory playing tricks on me I'm not sure but I suspected that film would just make me really sad so I didn't I didn't go and see it but what I do know about Amy Winehouse is obviously she was surrounded by um, some loving people and some absolute scumbags <laughs> I mean I think this is fairly uncontroversial um, and Amy Winehouse was not someone who had a happy connected life if you think about rock stars and actually um, this is something uh can I say this? Yeah. Elton John, I think Elton John said this publicly. If, the, sorry, I suddenly paused. The, um, you know, if you talk to people like Elton John or Russell Brand, when you're in that kind of situation and you're that famous, not only do you not have a connected life, you literally can't walk the streets, right? You can't walk down the street. You can't trust anyone you know. You can't, um, in Amy Winehouse's case, Quite, she was right not to trust them. They were selling stories to the newspapers about her. The newspapers were hacking her phone. Um, she was in a state of paranoia, quite rightly. So I think Amy Winehouse is not a model of someone who had a happy, connected life and inexplicably became an addict. She's someone who had a really disrupted, disturbed life um, and, and was anaesthetizing herself. It's worth remembering, by the way, she did not die of drug addiction. People forget this. She died of alcohol-related addiction and alcohol-related issues and other problems, including an eating disorder. Her pain was very, very deep, and it's very revealing. That actually, it seems that in, for a significant period before she died, she wasn't using drugs, if I remember the reports rightly, the autopsy report. So again, I think that helps us to understand that this idea that it's the drug that hijacks you and destroys you was not the case in Amy, in Amy Winehouse's case, and is, not, is a misunderstanding about what addiction is. Which is not to say the drug can't cause additional harm. Of course it can. A terrible additional harm, and it depends on the drug, and they do different additional harms. Mm. So, um, if you'll take place. Of course. Hooray. The panel, thank you. Mm -hmm. So. So, I would like for you to address um, some of the challenges we're facing when it comes to, to drugs. Um, what's the big picture? Uh, what's the scope of the war on drugs? 
the damages. Um, but first, I would like to hear from the panel. Um, why do you think that Hari has gotten so much attention? Uh, maybe I can, can answer. Sure. For, I have to just ask one question first. You can own a line in the UK? I'm pretty sure you can own a line, yeah. I should say we've met before in really weird circumstances, but let's not talk about that. But anyway, sorry. The, uh, so it's slightly surreal that you're here in this circumstance. It's like a, it's like a weird stress dream. But anyway, I won't say any more about that. Good. Yeah, you can own a line, yeah. And still you're envious of Norway. I think that is, uh, <laughs> yeah, that is absurd. Oh. It's, it's great to know. Uh, well, why, why has this caught fire? Uh, I think it's two, two reasons. The one is that uh, Jan Hari is a great communicator, which you've just witnessed. That is an important factor for all, for all issues that needs to be raised, that you need someone to actually raise them in, a, in an understandable way. Uh, the second reason is, uh, has less to do with you, and that is that there is, a, there, there is a shift going on, uh, driven by experienced research that's been going on for many years. Even in Norway, I mean, you talk about our policies, but the, the public debate has, has been shifting over a number of years. The policies have shifted a little bit as well, um, and the, the understanding of the problem. We're, we're lagging behind, but it's shifting in Norway, in the US, in Europe. Uh, the debate is shifting. Policies are always five to 10 years behind uh, the debate, but that's been going on because we have these uh, results you know, from, from Switzerland, Portugal, the Netherlands, uh, the US. Uh, when it's going slow, I think it's also because it's uh, Debates are always a little bit more complicated than like, when, when you present your case, you, you tell a story that is convincing, and then, then the opponents come and ask all the nitty-gritty detail questions. And some of them we might get back to discuss uh, later on. I was in a debate yesterday on, on uh, national TV with uh, the health minister. Of course, he doesn't, we, we don't see eye to eye on this uh, question. But there, there, there are some, some sort of legitimate concerns that we, we need to be able to address convincingly and able to, to move politics forward. Mm. I think uh, probably I will agree <laughs> in this. I think there are uh, important shifts going on. We can see it even if Norway has been very traditional uh, and we have had very ideological colored debates uh, and been very moralistic in the way we have been approaching drugs and uh, drug addicts. Uh, but there are, as in my own university, like Willy Pedersen, who has gone in and, based on his research, uh, suggests that we should legalize uh, marijuana, which is a very new <laughs> way that researchers stand up. And I think Harris is um, probably the right kind of person at the right time because he. Uh, uh, says openly what a lot of people have been thinking, but it's been extremely difficult to say it aloud. So I think saying these things clear and loud, uh, still, but I will return to that, uh, you do a few <laughs> uh, shortcuts <laughs> that me as a clinician and having been actually dealing with and treating uh, drug addicts for uh, probably as long as you have lived, I guess. <laughs> uh, and I find that some of the generalizations you make are very simplified, but when you are trying to change attitudes, you have to do some of those shortcuts, I guess. Mm. Uh, Helena, you're yes. uh, working at the EMCDDA, but you're here on behalf of yourself, yes. not talking for the organization, of course. Yes. But you have a lot of knowledge, uh, and I was wondering, it's a big question, but... Uh, you can answer it any way you like, but to what extent is Europe using drugs? To, uh, excuse me? In what way, what kind of drugs, what, what do you see when, like, the big picture when it comes to drugs in uh, Europe? It's, uh, it's uh, a bit different from uh, Norway and Sweden uh, and a few other countries that we, they, it's less of injecting uh, drugs, uh, injecting uh, uh, drugs and uh, more on new uh, drugs, like legal heights, which is not legal, but uh, so, uh, <laughs> so it has uh, shifted. Uh, so it's a few countries that remains with uh, this kind of problematic uh, yeah, Like use. which countries? Uh, like heroin, injecting yeah. heroin. Uh, 
the, the whole Europe and the whole world is still cannabis. This is the major drug. Um, uh, funny, as a scientist, uh, what does research on drug addiction tell us? Uh, say again, please. It's a little difficult because yeah. of the oh, sorry. sound system. Sorry, uh, as a, you're a scientist, of, yeah. uh, partly of, you've been treating people for drug addictions. So uh, what does the research tell us? What, what, what shortcuts do Hari make, for example? Um, yeah, um, I think uh, to make it simple, um, I would just say there are many ways into addiction and there are many ways out of it. And having an unhappy life can be one element, but it doesn't explain the whole picture. And also giving uh, drug addicts a more decent life has in itself an in enormously importance. And I agree completely that this is important in itself from a humanistic perspective. But that will not be enough when you are treating people with addiction problems, because you can, um, and it's interesting because I've actually been doing that kind of experiments when I was young and very enthusiastic, I'm still enthusiastic, but I have learned that it's a little more complicated than giving people jobs and a place to live and start to behave, uh, treat them nicely. It's important in itself, but addiction is a complicated uh, lifestyle problem, and you need to address it. So what's the typical the problem when you, when you give someone help? Uh, a typical problem is uh, that, uh, like in, for instance, what we experienced is that, yes, I have now a place to go, and I can start to work. But then, uh, after a short while, the enthusiasm is not that high because what you have and what you can do is taken as granted. And then you start to think, but this is rather boring. Uh, or I now cannot do things I enjoy doing. Uh, I have to start to behave in ways that I'm not quite happy about. And then you start to slip out of that good patterns. And this about, because this is something about changing your lifestyle. And we all know that changing lifestyles is hard work for a long time. Mm. There are no quick fixes on that. Mm. And you can do it uh, under good circumstances or you can even manage to do it under bad circumstances. But in order to deal with it, you need to have more of the bits or the jigsaw puzzle mm. that is a human being. And so I think the individual differences and individual needs, uh, we need to address them as part of appropriate treatment. Mm. Nils August? Yeah, I just want to say a, a few things. Um, when you talk about how this whole regime, how this war on drugs came into being, because there's sort of different stories. Um, both, or two, say two main stories, both of them have some truth to them, but they're quite different. One of them starts about 1960 and ends with Nixon sort of declaring the war on drugs, uh, partly as a consequence of, of racism and anti-hippie sentiment and sort of the hysteria of, of drugs in the new culture in the 60s, which definitely explains sort of the tenor of that debate at the time. But, but the prohibition of morphine and opiates started before that because for, for a different reason, precisely because some of those grandmas with the hip replacement did get addicted. Uh, and those were the old, in, in Norwegian we had the word morphinist, which uh, sort of often the upper classes that could afford that kind of treatment in the, in the you know, early 20th century. So, so some of them did became addicted. And then there's really a legitimate concern to, to uh, have some control on consumption. And of course, we, we all know that, you know, the alcohol, which is legal, this is, would be the counter argument, uh, alcohol, which is legal, is consummated very widely, but also has very big negative consequences. So that is one of the reasons it came into being. Of course, that does not, uh, I should maybe be clear on my own political stance here. I'm, I, my first article on this topic, uh, 
had the title "Legalize Everything Now," <laughs> so so it's sort of I'm I'm not in the grey zone on on the on the political <laughs> issue, but I think it's important sometimes to sort of to, to get wh where did it come from and how do we navigate out of it. And I think what, what, so a lot of those people are addicted now. I mean they they are in these bad life situations and they're they're not in the in the rat. Uh, rat haven, but they are in the rat park. But 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 uh, they are also often in the, the category of people who, who respond most strongly to the chemicals. So it is, it is, we have to deal with that as well. The problem with prohibition uh, is, uh, and it's a little bit different for different drugs. But you know, let's talk about heroin first, which is one of the most important things. Uh, is that there is absolutely no evidence that it reduces consumption because it's so obviously harmful. I mean, you, cannabis is different because it's obviously attractive to a lot of people. But heroin isn't really attractive in the same sense. People don't want to use that. And, uh, and that isn't a theoretical argument, but then you have empirical, and I think empirical arguments are always better. So we, ha we, ha we have what's happened in Switzerland. I mean, again, not just oversimplify. It's not the case that no people die in Switzerland uh, deaths have gone, gone down, but there's still about 100, 100, 150. It's not on legal heroin. It's no, 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 that's, on, that, that's true. So it's the people who are not on the program, but it's only about 5 to 7% is actually on the program. Uh, and the worry, of course, again, is that if everyone is on the program, w what would happen then? And I think they could probably expand it, um, but, but, it's, uh, but it shows some of the dilemmas in, in there. But we have at least, at least we have this policy that we know is better than the current one, or at least to be very conservative. We know that, and I'm of course a conservative, uh, we, 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 know, we know that it's, it's at least not worse than what we're doing now. Mm. Uh, and uh, the other part of what you were talking about, you, you talked quite a bit of it, I think that is, that is sort of the, the weighty argument that m makes this so clear to me, because you, you could argue about how to treat and exactly what role does heroin prescription play in that, and how should we regulate it? But but the cost of the prohibition in terms of the war on drugs, not in not in Oslo and not in or only to a certain degree in Oslo, only to a certain degree in London, but in those other countries, Mexico, Afghanistan, Latin America, that is where you see the vast cost. I mean, we see it here as well. And I wanted to bring up this point because mm. it's about dehumanizing. Because we, I think in Norway now, we are actually st starting to stop to dehumanize the uses. Uh, and that's why we're, there is sort of a consensus. It's not being implemented for some reason, but there seems to be a consensus that we shouldn't punish them. But we still do. That's one of the paradoxes of prohibition. We, yeah. we somehow we'll get to that to. later. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but just to say very quickly that we, the, uh, the, the drug sellers are still completely dehumanized. Mm. One third of the Norwegian pr 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 prison population. And often it's the same people who, who use and sell. And often they have terrible backgrounds too. And often they're not white in their skin. And they're completely sort of out of the picture. It's a huge cost, one third of the prison population. We don't think about that as a cost. Mm. I mean, if we, if we ended prohibition, we would, re we would reduce that substantially. Some of them would do other criminal stuff, but we, we would reduce it substantially. We know that. And we don't really attach any weight, or many people don't really attach any weight to that, which I think is very unfortunate to be, use a conservative expression again. Mm. So talking about invisible people, mm. um, Johan, um, does the Scandinavian drug use um, have an impact on the situation in, say, Mexico? Uh, can I ask that? Just, I just want to respond to that, because I actually think, yeah, sure, the, sure. I think, I think um, the points that you guys make are really, really excellent, and I agree with you, and I think you're, you're right that, you know, um, in a sense, what I'm giving are the headlines, and I hope that the book gives a more complex and nuanced uh, picture, and I think you're absolutely right. It's important to say solving these problems does not solve it for everyone. It's why Portugal had a 50% fall, not a 100% fall. Um, so you're absolutely right. There are, for anything as complex as human addiction, there is a very complex range of uh, responses. I didn't talk here, for example, about childhood trauma. There's overwhelming evidence about childhood trauma's role in addiction. Um, just to give one, um, so I think you're totally right that there is a more complex picture than you can distill in 30 minutes and definitely much more complex than you can distill in 10 minutes, which is normally what I get, so thank you. Um, <laughs> the, um, the, um, I think you're totally right. I also think in, in terms of the... It's very interesting because I used to believe what you said about that when they banned drugs, it was partly because of the fear about addiction. It was really interesting. I spent loads of time in the archives looking back over all the debates at the time and that stuff barely came up. It's really The main debate... And it's really, it sounds ludicrous and like I'm caricaturing it. I'm really not. The debate was, in the United States, mm. blacks and Chinese 
are using drugs and attacking white people. That, mm. And that's why we've got to ban drugs. I mean, that's like the official government statements. It's really weird when you read it. D d addiction barely comes up. Protecting mm. children doesn't come up. Um, apart from protecting them from the marauding blacks and Chinese. Um, so it, it's really curious, the, the, the early origins of this. But anyway, so to answer your question, sure, I mean, it affects it. I, I get very frustrated when people say, though, oh, do you condemn drug users because they're causing the violence in Mexico? It's not drug users that are causing the violence in Mexico. It's drug prohibition that's causing the violence in Mexico. You could have all the same drug use and none of the violence. Um, I also get a bit frustrated. I, I recently had someone say this to me, and I kind of thought, who was not a drug user, and I kind of thought, you know, me and you are both wearing clothes that were probably made by Bangladeshi children and Chinese slaves. I had in my pocket, and he had in his pocket, a mobile phone made out of Congolese coltan. I covered the war in the Congo. That's the deadliest war since the Second World War. Five million people died. It was caused for that coltan. And then the phone was assembled by Chinese slaves. We are all enmeshed in grotesque systems of oppression that we should change and we need to urgently challenge. But to single out within all the nexuses, nexus, what is the plural of nexus? Anyway, whatever it is. With it, single out of all the webs of oppression in the world, to single out drug users and blame them, I think is just a way of renewing the stigma in kind of politically correct garb. Not that you're doing that, I know you're not doing that. But, So um, let's talk about the policy and the legislation in different countries and what works better. So, um, uh, Nils August, uh, it's kind of a tricky question, but where is the drug policy coming from? Coming from, we, we just sort of touched on it. I think it, it has national origins in each uh, each country, and you know there, there weren't that many blacks, in, especially Chinese in Norway in, 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 the, in the 50s. So I think the debate looked a little bit different if sure, you sure. went to the Norwegian archives. Mm. But, uh, but but of course, if you go to to the U.S. in the 60s, I mean that is that is part of the picture, and even before that, the drug policy. If you go a little bit further back and look at the the bigger picture, um, I think we should also recognize the Norwegian role in this whole this whole mess globally. Uh, because the whole idea of prohibition, uh, I mean, it was, it was in many countries, but it was a very Norwegian initiative. And the guy who did it in the US, or at least named the, the act and was the artist proponent of it, Andrew Volstead, uh, born in Songen in, uh, in Norway, and an ardent Lutheran. Uh, and it comes from this, I mean, and, and in the US it was the, the Protestants and especially the Lutherans who were... I blame uh, all of you personally. Uh, <laughs> in uh, favor of alcohol prohibition. And it was this sort of mix of social compassion, in a sense, because you saw the devastation that it led to, uh, and this moralistic, paternalistic instinct that you shouldn't do this, it would be better for you, and let us help you by prohibiting it. Uh, and also, you know, also, you're the children of Satan. So, <laughs> so a little bit of that, you know, you could throw that in the mix. And, and the, you had the same, then we had prohibition here as well, only for, for hard liquor. Uh, and out of that whole debacle, you had the, the mafia in the US and the, the sort of the thought about prohibition as the way to go. Of course, it wasn't new. We have to remember that I think drugs are inherently problematic. That is one of the reasons we we struggle with dealing with them and, and how to deal with them. You had I mean, the opium war, it was prohibited in China. Uh, the Brits uh, you know, said you have, to, you have to legalize it because we want to trade. I apologize <laughs> on behalf of my nation. <laughs> so, but but it's a, it goes back and forth and we, don't, we never seem to find the right balance. And I think what a, what a sort of, because you know, free sale of all these, all the different kinds of drugs, they're, they're all, some of them are different, some of them could be sold for, quite freely, I think, but some of them surely couldn't. And one of the things that has changed a little bit since, you know, the last hundred years is that we've been better at regulating. That's why I think it, it's much more feasible now to, to really regulate this in, in, not in an optimal or perfect fashion, but in the way that makes most sense. And in Norway, this is, we, you know, we do that with alcohol, we debate it quite a bit, but we do regulate it very heavily, and that has a lot of support, and it works reasonably well. And uh, it's, you know, that's certainly, you should think that that would serve as a model for, well, let's think in those same terms about other drugs. But instead, we've made this sort of bifurcation where you have alcohol and narcotics, rather than seeing them all as drugs, which they really are. I mean, the only, the definition of nar a narcotic drug is just that it's illegal. 
I mean, there is nothing inherently narcotic about the, the drug. Uh, and that is sort of, that clouds our minds when you think about it, because we think, well, alcohol, of course, you can regulate, but narcotics, that's an entirely different story. But it isn't, it's the same story, and we need to, to find ways to, to regulate. Maybe some things should be prohibited. I mean, when you talk about regulate, you also talk about prohibiting certain variants of the drug, for instance. What you want to do is to regulate so that you have, uh, you minimize the amount of illegal activity that goes on. You minimize the dangerous drugs that people use when they can have access to something that they will use, which is less harmful. And that approach is it's so strange in Orient sense because that is the approach that we usually have. We just don't include narcotics in that approach. Mm. Mm. Uh, Helena, you were uh, you've done research on the Stoltenberg report from mm -hmm. 2010. Um, can you tell us a bit about it and what happened and what has, ha has happened since then? Uh, yes, I don't know that much about what happened uh, lately because... It I think you have to speak up just a Yeah, a it, bit. it didn't happen much lately uh, with these uh, proposals. But I, uh, I looked to the Stoltenberg uh, committee's report and uh, they are um, they are proposing uh, two uh, kind of measures uh, based directly on the Portuguese uh, drug strategy, and it's on uh, decriminalizing drug users. And uh, what I find interesting when we talk about drug policy and addiction. Uh, it's that uh, the, the debate in Norway, it has been very normative uh, driven. And it has been a very huge focus on uh, the m majority of uh, the Norwegian population, uh, which, who, which is, uh, who is not using drugs. So in a way they, have been more uh, uh, focused on saving the population. And they are afraid that more people will start using drugs uh, if, for example, they are soft on drug policy. Uh, so we have some governance traditions in Norway, I think, uh, that uh, finds it we want to help, but we, want, we don't want to give the wrong signal to people. So uh, they, in a way, you can say, a bit uh, simplified, that we use the problematic drug users, there are not that many in, in Norway, uh, as a part of the signal effect, if you understand. Mm. So, so the signal effect, uh, funny, uh, yeah. that's, that's quite, um, quite different from um, researchers. When you're, when you're doing science, you can't mm. think, about, think about that too much. Um, so um, everyone is always talking about um, uh, knowledge-based policy. Mm. Um, but what does, what does that really mean when you think about things like normativeness and normativity and signals in drug use? Well, I think that uh, the field of addiction is a field that is very much influenced by myths and morals, even among the scientists, even... Uh, and we can see that, uh, for instance, um, in America, where it has been difficult to get funding for research on addiction if you don't support a certain ideology, which makes very strong influence on what kind of research is allowed or uh, possible to do on addiction. And I think that is very worrisome in a way that even the researchers have been influenced. And there is much more research on certain elements included in addiction than others, uh, which also makes an impact on what is allowed. Um, and then, in addition, you have this that the politicians 
as was mentioned, they have their own ideas about what is actually taking place. So we have the myths about who are the addicts, uh, what is addiction, and it's more important to fall for them to follow their own viewpoints than what we actually know. Because what we know based on science is that there's a huge variety um, among people who moves into addictive problems. And there are different kinds of addictions. There are complicated um, elements. And the big, big problem, I think, in the debate is that it is actually alcohol that is the big killer. Uh, the drug problems, the extent and the impact of drug problems is very, very tiny, but if you read the debate or read the newspapers, you'd think that, for instance, in Norway, we have a much bigger drug problem that we actually have. And as I think you mentioned, for instance, like those uh, deaths by overdose, very often alcohol is included, and what they actually die of is the alcohol element. So, so the whole debate and also the so-called science here are often skewed. And, um, and it is, uh, for instance, what we overlook, I think uh, if we did an experiment and said that we did, alcohol did not exist, and we should just choose one kind of substance for people to use when they want to be intoxicated, which one should we choose? And what is very clear that is that alcohol would be the first one to be prohibited. It would never be introduced if we know now what uh, the damage is uh, with alcohol is. So probably the one drug we would choose was marijuana because it's much less toxic, it gives much less uh, side effects that are harmful for society. So the problem is that this is a very complicated discussion and it's difficult and also something that the drug addicts have a symbolic role as the good enemy. Because they are few, they are weak, they, it's very easy for like politicians to show muscles and be big uh, decision makers to run after and make life like hell for the drug addicts. Mm. Uh, Nils I just wanted to, to, to briefly defend Norwegians and Norwegian <laughs> society. We are, we have lots of problems, but we are, you know, we're equal in a sense towards alcohol. We are uh, moralistic towards everyone. And if you read the newspaper, <laughs> yeah. you'll find a lot about how terrible alcohol is. And I know this because I, I wrote an article where I thought I should, okay, I'll let me write something positive about alcohol. <laughs> I, I don't agree with the demonization <laughs> okay. of alcohol here, but it, but it's, uh, it was impossible to find. I read every single uh, article about it in the three main newspapers for half a year. All, all were negative, with two exceptions. Islam. So, I mean, Turkey did something to say that you shouldn't sell alcohol near to kindergartens. They're like, okay, this is Islam, is being terrible. Uh, so, we need to have alcohol with, with, the, with the children. <laughs> of course, it's still much more liberal than in, than in Norway. But it's, so, we have this attitude to, towards alcohol as well. Uh, the, pr the difference, is, of course, is that alcohol is legal, so we don't have the additional problems. I can guarantee you, know, if alcohol was, if alcohol were prohibited, we would have a lot of, a lot of debate and demonization and all these kind of things going on. Because it, <clears throat> but because it isn't, we, we don't. We speak about it slightly differently, but we do treat it as a as a major concern. Uh, funny, May I just just that a little, because one thing is the articles. They're always about negative elements yeah. of alcohol, yeah. but yeah. then you have all right. the other yep. things. Mm. Uh, now we are testing Christmas beer. Mm. They know this sells newspapers in <laughs> enormous <laughs> numbers. Mm. Uh, we have all the reportages, and there has actually been quite a change. Like, for instance, now it's uh, very possible for Norwegian to say in public, Yes, I'm drinking. I want to be drunk. It's fun. And I, we do it. And you will get a big four pages uh, reportage uh, following you <laughs> in this happy event. 
So uh, you just, uh, just very quickly one <laughs> yes, thing that I think I just want to add to the uh, point that you made that I think is so important about the distortion of the science. There's this great Harry Anslinger, the guy I was talking about who, who invents the modern drug war, along with the kind of cultural trends of the time. There's a moment when someone challenged him very early on and saying, I don't, a scientist, and said, I don't think this is right, I don't think these facts are right. And he said this line that I think is like a motto for the whole approach. I've made up my mind, don't try to confuse me with the facts. <laughs> and I think that really informs the whole way we've looked at the science ever since. Yeah, but that's a good point because um, um, a survey, uh, you've been here for uh, 24 hours now, <laughs> approximately, and uh, I would like to hear from you what's your impression when it comes to drug policy. You've all, you already said quite a lot about it, but I want you to take into consideration, you've probably, um, you've maybe heard it before, but a survey executed by uh, ACTIS, ACTIS, uh, which is a Norwegian organization fighting um, addiction and drug use, correct me if I'm wrong, um, only 12% of the Norwegian population want to legalize uh, cannabis in Norway. Uh, so, the situation here is carefully put quite different from, say, Canada, um, where Justin Trudeau want to, wants to um, legalize uh, marijuana. So, I'm wondering, uh, what process have, say, Canada been through that we haven't here in Norway? Um, I'll just say a few things about my impression in Norway. The first is, there must be a physically unattractive Norwegian person but where are they? Like, it's really weird. Like, it's actually quite sinister. It's like, the, in a Venn diagram, the most attractive British person is still less attractive than the least attractive Norwegian. It's really depressing. Um, I don't know how you can bear to come to Britain. We must be, like, twisted. It must be I disgusting think, for I you. Think Britain is the outlier. Right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. Maybe. I, I love my country for many reasons, but we're not hotties. Um, the, um, the, in terms of the, that... that um, I'd say one thing about Canada, but I would just say about, uh, this was related to it, so the 12% of, of, um, of people here uh, believe in, in legalized marijuana. Um, eight, eight days ago, I was sitting, nine days ago, I was sitting in the Stonewall Inn in New York, right? And I was thinking, so you had 2,000 years of gay people being described as evil. And in 1969, the pro-gay position, which was held by a lot less than 12% of Americans, was, okay, gay people aren't evil, but they are diseased. That was the pro-gay position, and it was really unusual. And a bunch of drag queens said, you're not going to do this to us anymore, and they start a riot. And when I get really pessimistic about this, and sometimes, you know, when you hear a survey like that, you feel pessimistic, I try to imagine standing outside the Stonewall Inn that night and saying to those people, okay, you're not going to believe me, but 46 years from now, the President of the United States is going to name this as one of the greatest moments in American history. And by the way, he's going to be black, right? <laughs> that would have sounded like the most ridiculous nonsense. A lot of those drag queens live to see that happen, right? So social changes can happen incredibly quickly, and it completely goes to why there's been this change in Canada. There's lots of reasons, but one is, and I tell the story in my book, there was a movement of drug users. Homeless, it was actually started by a homeless drug addict who I got to know, Bud Osborne, one of the most extraordinary people I've ever known. Um, a movement of homeless street addicts who gathered together and like those drag queens said, you're not doing this to us anymore. And they started a movement to pressure the government, to, uh, the government of initially Vancouver, the mayor of Vancouver, a man called Philip Owen, to open the first safe injecting drug room in, in North America. And it succeeded. So politicians are only as good as the pressure put on them. And if, you know, any politician is constantly making a calculation. If I do this, how much praise will I get and how much shit will I get, right? And at the moment, if you're a Norwegian politician and you do a good thing on drug policy, you'll get very little praise and a whole lot of abuse, right? So that's why they're not doing it. If you guys organize and demand it, you can change that calculus. It's why things changed on gay people. It was no politician in America. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I'm going to give the word to you, Nils Agus, but first I just want to... Um, we're also talking about 88% who doesn't want this at all. So, it's easy maybe for us to sit here, um, 
being educated and talking about how can we get people to legalize marijuana, but don't we also have a responsibility to like communicate with these people and like <laughs> does the media have a responsibility? Are we doing it all wrong when we're just sitting here in Oslo mm. and talking mm. and people don't want that at all? Well, well you're always slightly doing it wrong because you, you, you are now the sort of the liberal elite uh, saying we, we, the educated, should we go out and tell the 80% community that they are stupid and that they should come around? Hello, you know? fools. <laughs> but, but, but We've I think come some, to tell you better. Uh, yeah, some of the these debates are one of the differences between North America and Norway is that we have uh, fairly low uses, uh, usage of cannabis. So, so uh, like that's why there's a, there, fewer people know someone who smokes. A lot of people know people who smoke, but they don't know that they do so, uh, which is one of the problems. But still, just because the numbers are smaller, the, the circles of that are smaller. Uh, so, and I think maybe it hasn't been seen, seen as such a big problem. I think I want to just add one nuance to the cannabis debate. I mean, I've looked into a lot of the research there. And uh, first, I found some research saying, you know, uh, prohibition doesn't really affect cannabis use at all, but it does to a certain extent. Is there seems to be the consensus? It's a little bit, you know, you find a bit of this, a bit of that, but it seems to increase a little bit. And then you can discuss how harmful would that be. And I'm certain that I don't think it's worth the cost of the prohibition. But that is that would be the counter argument. It's a valid counter argument there that you have to factor in. And I and I think that partly explains the opposition. But I do think, as you said, you know, wh how did it change w with the gay community? And one of the things that came out of this in the 60s, where, where a lot of, I, I inter interviewed a guy that you might have talked to as well, Ethan Nadelman. Love Ethan, yeah. Uh, and he, he talked about how gay people were seen as these very promiscuous, uh, you know, people with feathers and uh, very sort of c c caricatured people, fl very flamboyant, and they would uh, people would say, even the people who wouldn't say they're you know, devils and sinners would say, well, but they're very strange, aren't they? And it's a little bit the same with drug, drugs, because it's hidden. Uh, so, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of ordinary Norwegians smoke cannabis, but, a ver but very few people say so publicly. And the ones who do, like a, a member of parliament that was busted in a, in a thing like that one or two years ago. He was reprimanded very severely and maybe some of his political opportunities were sort of uh, diminished at least, at least temporarily. So you have that aspect. That's why I usually say, even though like I'm the worst cannabis smoker ever, but I usually just say that, you know, I've smoked cannabis on a number of occasions just, to, just because it should be normalized to say it because that would make the debate more honest. I, mm. <laughs> Uh, I, I do think there is a change going on in, uh, I mean, I do think the media is helping. I mean, I, I don't think the media should campaign. That's not what the media is about. But, but I think that when I write about this, uh, you know, the media is very responsive. I think the media do recognize that you know, the, there is new information coming in. We had it on the main debate show on primetime TV in Norway yesterday. Uh, so that's just one example of that this debate is actually entering the, the public uh, domain. And I've been invited you know, to, to radio and newspapers numerous times because they recognize that there is a demand for, for raising that debate. So I think the media is doing its job, but it's going to take some time. Just want to close quickly by saying I think, I think there is quite a bit of movement now in order on heroin. Unfortunately, it hasn't reached the the top levels of government uh, in the current government, uh, which is very unfortunate since it's my party. But, but, it's, uh, uh, but it is changing quickly. You, know, you have the Labour Party, you have the, the Liberal Party, you have uh, the youth parties of both the, the, the current government parties are also in favour of doing something. So th there's a very quick change there. And you see it even with this octus you mentioned, the, the sort of anti-drug, anti anti-drug organization. When you talk about drug uh, heroin prescription today, people will, if, before they would say, it's terrible, it's, uh, you know, it's sending the wrong signal and it uh, destroys life, it's giving up on people, would be the usual thing that they would say. Now people don't really say that anymore. Mm -hmm. They say, well, but it's not that important. I mean, the important thing is all the other things that we should do for these people, giving, you know, giving, uh, somewhere to live, finding a job. That's the important thing. So we don't want to talk about drug prescription. Mm. Uh, but the opposition is weakening and they sort of recognize it. They retract from that position. Uh, cannabis, it's not changing in the same, with the same speed. Uh, but I, I think that what's happening in the US, Uruguay, some other countries, it's 
depending on the experience there, it will reverberate somehow slowly, those waves will cross the Atlantic Sea, even if it takes time. Mm. Uh, Helena? Mm -hmm. yeah. I just wanted to, uh, to uh, say that when uh, Portugal changed to decriminalization in 2000, uh, the main concern uh, for the population, it was the drug addiction with heroin uh, in, injection uh, people. And I think uh, this uh, Gulao, as you mentioned, he talked about that everyone in, everyone in the society knew someone who had this addiction. And I think this is also related to your book, that we, you, you, you speak about people you care for, people you love, and people you want to help. And I think this is, if, like, for example, the Stoltenberg uh, uh, Committee, he has, uh, he had a drug addict in his uh, family. Uh, the same with uh, the president in, uh, in uh, Portugal, and also the uh, Minister of Health. I think this helps to see the human approach. You want to help, you want to, to treat people with or without addiction uh, with dignity. I think this is uh, an important thing to uh, consider when we talk about uh, drug policy, because often in the debates it's about numbers, uh, who is, wh what is working, what mm. is not working. Okay, we have a low prevalence, then we have a good drug policy. This is not mm. the case, uh, and uh, we know, don't know that much, but we know pretty much about what doesn't work, and among other things, it's to, to criminalize users. Mm. It doesn't mm. work. Yeah. So, um, we're getting to the end of this session, um, uh, but I want to speak a bit about the optimal solution. Um, how do we best take care of people? Yeah, I'll give you um, the um, one of the I have two questions left, and the first one is, um, you can't say uh, cannabis isn't dangerous, and um, say heroin is the most humane solution to um, treating heavy addicts, and uh, say MDMA and psychedelica have, uh, can have a therapeutic effect and should be used in treating people. If all these drugs should be decriminalized or even legalized. What to do with drugs like amphetamine, cocaine and GHB? Drugs that can hardly be said to do any good in any way. Or? Oh, well, I would say several things about that. Firstly, I would never say cannabis isn't dangerous. Like all things, like so many things, it has harms. We know that cannabis is harmful to forming teenage brains, um, for example. And um, you know, my book is dedicated to my nephews who are teenagers, who I really don't want to use cannabis, partly because of my family's history as well. And um, I'm not in favour of legalisation despite that, but because of that. The best way to explain it, and this is really important for the Norwegian debate, a lot of people will say to you, we can't legalise drugs because of our children. Um, I went in New Jersey, I interviewed a guy called Fred Martins, who's a really right-wing cop. He reminded me uncannily of the Clint Eastwood character in Dirty Harry. And... One day, uh, in the early 70s, he was staking out a car park in New Jersey. And so he was in plain clothes, and he was watching a drug dealer. And a kid came up to him, like a 10 or 11-year-old, and said, hey, mister, will you go into that liquor store and buy me some booze, because I'm not allowed to go in there? And Fred said, no, get out of here. So the kid walked up to the drug dealer and bought some drugs from him instead, because drug dealers don't check ID. And although Fred wouldn't put it in such a fancy way, he had this epiphany that legalization puts a barrier between our children and drugs that does not currently exist. No one in my nephew's school is selling weed and pills. Loads of kids. Uh, sorry, no one in my nephew's school is selling Jack Daniels or Heineken, and loads of the kids are selling weed and pills. That tells you something about what prohibition does. Um, 
In terms of the thing about, so per, per 100,000 users, cocaine kills far fewer people than alcohol. For example, so often cocaine is presented as this evil drug. All those drugs you named as uniquely evil. I'm not in favour of their use. I'm not in favour of alcohol use. Um, but they're no more addictive than the other drugs. As I say, Carl Hart's research is very important on this at Columbia University in New York. 90% um, of people who use those drugs you named don't become addicted, just like alcohol. So I don't think those are uniquely evil. I think in terms of how we uh, proceed from here, although there are some harms associated with them, obviously. I think how we proceed from here is we need to cautiously experiment. We've had 100 years of an experiment in one way, and that way has been a disaster. The United States has spent a trillion dollars, it's killed hundreds of thousands of people, and at the end of all that, they can't even keep drugs out of their prisons, and they pay someone to walk around the perimeter the whole time, which gives you some idea of how well that's ever going to work. So we've got to have cautious experiments. We'll attend to some places will um, experiment with a uh, regulated sale of them, maybe it will be worse. We'll see. We need to do it carefully. What's the line Obama said about Iraq? We need to be as careful getting out as we were careless getting in. I think that's true of the drug war. You know, you need to experiment cautiously, have small experiments in different places. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe some of these alternatives will be worse than what we have now, in which case we'll go back. But we should try and, and we should, and we should um, figure it out. Um, yeah, does that answer your... Oh, I just want to say one last, very quick last thing. I think uh, one thing you said is, is really important, which, and we've got to be candid about this. When you legalise, there will be some increase in use. There are clearly some people who don't take things because they're illegal, right? And there's some interesting research about this from uh, California. So they effectively legalised cannabis in California. They legalised medical marijuana, but anyone who went to the doctor and said they had a bad back could get it, right? So it was basically legalised for anyone who could be bothered to go to the doctor. And... Um, what they found is there was, the, it's hard to tell because you don't, it's hard to know if just more people admit to using a drug when it's legal, but there does seem to have been an increase in cannabis use. But what's interesting is there has been a fall in alcohol use. Not a huge fall, it seems to be about 10%. There's <coughs> lots of ways we can measure that. It's one of the reasons why the alcohol industry is so opposed to legalization of, of other drugs. So it looks like what happened is some people started using marijuana and stopped or transferred. So some people on a Saturday night where previously they would have got a bit drunk got a bit stoned. I don't think that's a particularly bad thing. That may actually be a good thing. At the very least, it's not a bad thing. And I think that tells us something. So when we look at the use that will happen, it's more accurate to say there will be a changing pattern of drug use, some of which will mean some drugs are used more, and some of which will mean some drugs like alcohol may be used less. I don't want to say that that confidently. We don't have that much evidence. But I suspect that would be the case. So it's a slightly more complicated picture than just yeah. more people will use full stop. Yeah. Uh, funny... Uh what do you think, if it's a question of maturity, um, uh, what kind of drug policy is Norway ready for? Um, if we're going to take like, a step <laughs> forward. <laughs> well, uh, I think Norway up to now has been very conservative, uh, very rigid in what is allowed to discuss in public. But I agree that I think it's about to change. And I think it's important that it's possible to discuss and debate these things and then not hurrying into dramatic changes, but at least start to have some thought experiments about what are the alternatives. And I think it's very important uh, is the, uh, to think about the harmful effects. Yes, I agree. All kind of addiction has and, and substance has harmful effects, and the best will be to use as little as possible. But how can we manage that? And it seems like we are starting to open up for discussing alternatives to the way we have done it. And loads of things we tolerate all the time. Mm. Loads of people die of peanut allergies. Mm. I don't even mean this is a joke. If you look at the figures, it's really shocking. Like loads of people die of peanut allergies. Cars, loads of people, I mean, everyone in this room will know someone who's died in a car accident, right? There's all sorts of risks that we tolerate as a culture. What we do is we introduce seatbelts and airbags and, you know, we don't just ban cars. Yeah. So, thank you very much. Um, we, have, we don't have much time, so I'm going to open up for three questions from the audience. Um, so, do I see any hands? I would just like to say first, uh, we, don't, we, we have time for questions, not lectures. 
just as a <laughs> <laughs> reminder. So do I see any hands? You look weirdly like ghosts, because a few of you have got iPads on, and you look like spectral yeah, ghosts in forward. darkness. It's kind of slightly sinister. You can come forward, yeah. Hello. <laughs> OK, uh, let's see. Find the best that one seems here. seems like a lecture. Uh, <laughs> scrolling. <laughs> A very common argument from the prohibition side here in Norway uh, is, uh, well, actually, which was uh, used last night uh, during a TV debate with the health minister, which I believe uh, you were in, uh, is that legalizing drugs uh, 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 other than alcohol would, in fact, cause existing alcohol users to consume more drugs on top of their alcohol use. Um, but during your research, did you actually find any evidence of this pattern actually occurring in, for example, Portugal or something? I mean, I, I know you mentioned this uh, during the debate, but did you actually find any evidence of, say, in California, uh, people getting drunk and then getting stoned, or did they sort of opt for one instead of the other more of the times? Yeah, so what we know, for, if trying to remember the study correctly, I don't want to say it wrongly. If I remember rightly, and I may be getting some of the small details wrong, there was a fall in, uh, the main way they knew there'd been a fall in alcohol is there was a fall in uh, DUIs, people driving while drunk, people being caught driving while drunk, which didn't happen in the surrounding states where they didn't legalize, which suggests there was a fall in alcohol use. Um, and I think there was a fall in alcohol sales, but I don't want to say that totally confidently. I'm pretty sure there was. Um, one thing we know is that you don't, so... Why would there be an increase in people wanting to get intoxicated because you'd legalized? I mean, is there anyone here who would go home tomorrow and study their law books, but if I told you heroin was legal, would go and use heroin instead? It's, it's quite, it doesn't really fit with anyone's real world experience. The idea that, it's suddenly, that legalization creates this huge pool of people who will seek out intoxicants who are currently sober seems to me implausible. Maybe it will happen. It didn't happen in Switzerland, but they had a very restricted model of legalization, obviously. It doesn't appear... There's, we're just gathering the evidence from Colorado and Washington now who legalized marijuana, and um, it, it, so it hasn't happened there. But, you know, we've got to experiment cautiously. Maybe that will happen. Maybe they're right. Then we'll know. But we can look at the places that were already tried, and it doesn't seem to be happening, but, but it's early days. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. This was one of the points yesterday that I didn't really get answered the way I get answered the way I should have. But uh, th there are different lines of research here, which complicates things a little bit. I agree with Johan. I think there are two kinds of studies that show that they go down. It's the traffic uh, incidents, and then it's price studies. What happens mm -hmm. when the price of because you can't really look at sales because they fluctuate too much. But you can look at uh, what happens when the price of Mariana goes up, uh, what happens uh, to, uh, or what happens when the price of alcohol goes up, what happens to Mariana price on the street. So, and they tend to show this uh, substitution effect. And then there are some other studies that are methodologically, in my view, flawed. Uh, they look at if there is a lot, of her uh, a lot of Mariana, a lot of alcohol in the same community, do they tend to be used together? And they often do. Uh, and if uh, places where you consume alcohol, are they likely more, more or less likely to consume Mariana? They're more likely. I think it's a bad methodology, but that has been used quite effectively by uh, opponents of this in Norway. And there's a researcher called Pakula who, it seems like Dracula, doesn't it? And she, she is a proponent of this line of research. It probably has, it's, it has a little bit more to it than what I said, but there are these two sort of opposing camps, and they oppose not because of the, uh, the empirical data, but because of their methodology. And that is, some, that is an important thing to sort of both clarify, but also, I think, uh, make people understand why uh, why there are good reasons to believe that there is a substitution effect. Well, can I just say one other thing in response to your, really your, so just very, very quickly. The, um, even if the worst case scenario was correct and there was a modest increase, because in, no one's predicting like a map, well, maybe they are, but no, no one serious person thinks there'll be a huge increase. If there's a modest increase in use, a modest increase in drug use weighed against 170,000 dead people in Mexico. Let's tell all those people in Mexico that we're killing them to stop a few more people getting stoned and see how they react. You know. Thank you.
Yeah, you can come down. Hi. Hi. Hello. Uh, I like for me. Beard. Sorry? No, nothing, sorry. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Marius is my name, by the way. Uh, for me, it seems to be that addiction has, there's two parts. There's a physiological addiction to a drug, and there's the psychological addiction to a drug, be it nicotine or be it heroin. Uh, for uh, addicts, how much is a physiological addiction and how much is the psychological addiction? And which is most important to treat? Uh, oh, and how do we treat it? Thank you. Um, it's not easy to give you a formal for this, but um, as far as we know, I think that it's the psychological addiction that is the important, and the psychological addiction is a flexible phenomena that can be influenced in different ways. So the biological part is there, but for most, it won't be the, most, the biggest part of the problem. There are a few people that you can see that, uh, the, that have some genetic vulnerabilities or that the uh, bio biological part is very strong, but the majority of people with addiction problems, it's in your mind. Okay, last one. Mm. Hi, um, I have a question about, because as you said, only 90% of people that use heroin are like, are not going to get addicted. And I'm just uh, wondering, when will we be ready to also include in the debate people that use drugs recreationally that are not addicts, but just use them like once a month or for like spiritual experience or for like any other like um, positive effects that they think the drugs gives them. And they're not addicts, they're not alcoholics, they're just regular citizens, regular people. Like when will we be ready for this kind of debate as well? Not only for trading people that use drugs only as an addict that need help. Um, I, can, well, I, mean, I, I think it's, it's again important to, to remember that we're talking about hundreds of differences of, of drugs. So if you talk about cannabis, I think that's a very valid point. And I, I mentioned it when we said, you know, so many Norwegians don't know that they knew a person who smoked cannabis regularly. And, and the, the member of parliament is a perfect example of that. But then you have, if you have heroin, I think, you know, you, you have the, the rats who didn't choose the, uh, the morphine. Uh, but they did, they did specifically not choose it. It's quite difficult to be a regular recreational heroin user with absolutely no problems. It, it, it occurs, it happens, uh, but it's, uh, there are differences between the different drugs. There's a little bit the same with, with, the, uh, with al alcohol. Everyone knows people who drink, and we do it, and it's fine. But everyone also knows people who drink all the time, and then you sort of can't call it a recreational phenomenon. Mm. I think it's interesting because one, I think it's so important that you made that point. One of the reasons we have a distorted picture, it, it's one of these weird things that prohibition creates a dynamic that then reinforces itself because any of you might put on, it's probably a little bit more socially taboo in Norway than in Britain, but you know, you could well say on Facebook, you know, after Saturday night or Sunday morning, had a great night last night, got really drunk, but you know, fell over, whatever. Um, and no one would think that was odd. You'd be very unwise to put on Facebook, had a great night last night, smoked, snorted five lines of coke, had a bit of crack, what a fantastic night, looking forward to it next week. So what happens is we get this really distorted picture of drug use where the only drug use that we hear about is the drug use that's really problematic. And it would be as if the only picture we had in our heads of alcohol use was like a homeless alcoholic in the gutter in a terrible state. And we thought, God, look at what alcohol does to people. Well, alcohol does do that to some people. Alcohol combined with terrible pain and isolation and all the other things we've been talking about. So I think you're right. We need to talk more about the vast, vast majority of drug use, which is not only not problematic, 
but experienced as positive in people's lives, it makes them feel better. And if it, I'm not one to tell them that it's not, I don't do it, but you know, whatever. It's your life. So it's a difficult, it's a politically harder conversation to have. The easy thing to say, and sometimes I'm tempted to do this, is to, it's politically easy to say, we all agree drugs are bad, it's just prohibition makes it even worse. This is a more complicated point that some drug use is terribly harmful, although it's got to be combined with these underlying factors that we've been discussing. Um, but to talk about positive drug use is, is, is hugely important, and I'm really glad you said that. Mm -hmm. so okay, final. Very <laughs> short. So very short. I, wrote, I, I mentioned that I wrote this article about positive aspects of alcohol use. Mm. I could have included other drugs in that, uh, but I don't have the enough experience with, with doing that. But uh, for alcohol use, and that was interesting because of the responses, because I did, I did put in these sort of mandatory lines about, you know, it can be harmful, we should regulate it. I'm actually in favor of quite strict alcohol laws as well, but, uh, but the responses, whereas if that was never said, it's like the responses from, from a prominent medical doctor was that, you know, alcohol is terribly dangerous and you are sending the wrong signal to people and that kind of stuff. And, you know, I sort of understand it. It's sort of this Norwegian instinct, or not only Norwegian, but that we, you know, well, we, we know it's the truth that a lot of people have pleasure from this or believe that, you know, believe that they enjoy it at least, uh, but we shouldn't talk about it. Uh, and I, I just don't think that approach, if it ever worked, I, in this day and age, it just does not work because people, you know, they're able to read even online, I've heard, and, uh, and, they, you know, and they talk and they know that there are some good things about this. And then if it's all denied in sort of the official rhetoric and in the news media, it's, it creates this discord, which, is, which creates a harmful debate. And in the case of of the illegal drugs uh, creates a very uh, unhelpful dynamic in, in terms of creating a positive uh, political discussion. So, um, we've come to the end, and I hope as many as possible of you will hang out in the Glasbarren downstairs. Some of us will be here. And uh, I would just like to say um, big thanks to the panel for coming here tonight. Special thanks to Johan for joining us. Thank you. Uh, one final thing. Um, I'll do this in Norwegian. Vi i Nattedag er opptatt av å dekke rus. Så for å kartlegge holdninger og vaner knyttet til rusbruk, så gjennomfører vi en undersøkelse på våre nettsider i samarbeid med Global Drug Survey. Eh, og vi setter stor pris på hvis så mange som mulig vil gå inn og ta den undersøkelsen. Og da kan man gå inn på nattedag.no. Eh, så so thank you again, everyone, very much. And you can, you can leave the stage now. Oh, Thank <laughs> you.